Beloved, if you have your, your Bibles with you here today, I ask that you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Ephesians chapter 3. And we are going to be lifting up verse 13, Ephesians chapter 3, and verse 13, we are continuing our uh, trek through this particular section and portion of Ephesians chapter 3, and uh, could everyone signal that they have that by just simply saying, Amen. 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 I'll begin reading. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and the tag we are adding on this particular text is the mystery of the gospel of grace. And this is part four. The mystery of the gospel of grace, part four. Ephesians is what we would call a prison epistle. And what makes Ephesians a prison epistle is because the person who wrote Ephesians was in prison when he wrote to the saints at Ephesus. And there is an incident in Acts chapter 21, verses 28 and 29, that is recorded by Luke, the beloved physician, which describes how the Apostle Paul landed in prison. Uh, the story goes there were some, some Jews from Asia who happened to see the Apostle Paul in the temple. And upon seeing the Apostle Paul in the temple, they accused the Apostle Paul of doing three things. And one is they accused the Apostle Paul of bringing Gentiles or Greeks into the temple. But secondly, they accused the Apostle Paul of preaching against Jewish people. And then thirdly, they accused the Apostle Paul of preaching against the Mosaic law. In other words, beloved, what they accused the Apostle Paul of doing was defiling their worship. And the only evidence that they had that the Apostle Paul defiled their worship was the fact that the Apostle Paul kept close association with a, a man by the name of Trophimus. And Trophimus was, as the text calls him, an Ephesian. He was a Gentile. And so they basically were mad at the Apostle Paul, who was a Jew, for hanging out or keeping close association with a Gentile. So they bring up some false charges. Yeah against the Apostle Paul. They, they trump up some, some, some false charges in, in which in our day we would simply call it an injustice or some unjust charges. It was a miscarriage of justice which resulted in the Apostle Paul suffering for something that he did not do. And beloved, let me ask you this. What do you do when someone brings up false charges against you, which results in you being persecuted? I suspect that uh, there would be a multitude, a, 
a variety of human emotions on display. If somebody were to bring up some false charges against us, which resulted in us being thrown into prison. Amen. And you know what? In our day, we have the opportunity to take our particular cause before a judge and allow a particular charge to work itself through the legal system. That's one of the beauties of living in America versus living in another part of the world. Our justice system, although not a perfect system, is the best justice system in the world. But for the Apostle Paul, there wasn't an American justice system. The only recourse the Apostle Paul had was to appeal to Caesar. Well. And what the Apostle Paul understood is, is that in appealing to Caesar, it was no guarantee that he was going to get justice. Mm -hmm. Actually, appealing to Caesar really would end up as Paul's life story tells us, and that is getting his head chopped off. It wouldn't end up in Paul being delivered. It ultimately meant that the apostle Paul was going to die. Mm -hmm. Yet you got to understand the Apostle Paul because for the Apostle Paul, it meant an opportunity. Amen. It meant an opportunity for him to even preach the gospel yeah. to Caesar. And my question again is, how does one endure such sufferings at the hands of men? Well, how do you endure something like that? And I want you to know today that it ultimately comes down to our perception of our suffering. Our perception of our suffering. And what I mean by our perception of our suffering is I'm speaking to our outlook of our suffering. Our vision in regards to our suffering. Our, our mindset in regards to our circumstances. What do you concentrate upon? Well, What do you concentrate upon when you find that in life your circumstances have become difficult? Or, or shall I phrase it this way? What are you focusing up on when there is some friction going on in your life? Can I tell you that for the Apostle Paul, his concentration, his focus was upon Jesus. Well, and can I encourage you that when a little friction comes into your life, when circumstances, if, if they be difficult circumstances, come into your life, can I encourage you to focus on Jesus? Come on, come on. Yes, in our season of difficult circumstances, the best remedy for us to do in order to keep us from losing our minds is to focus on Jesus. Yeah. And so for Paul, his perception of his suffering, his vision of his suffering, his understanding of his suffering was a heavenly one. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, the biggest lies that we are told sometimes in the church is, is that we can be so heavenly minded that we aren't any earthly good. You know, Paul debunks that here. Amen. He debunks that here because for the Apostle Paul, his perception had to be heavenly minded because if his perception was not heavenly minded we probably wouldn't have 13 levels. Yeah. Paul's perception had to be heavenly minded because it was through his heavenly focus of his sufferings that he was able to do earthly good even while he was in prison. And so even though his circumstances had not changed. Well, Paul's focus, his outlook, when he looked around him, it was still the same, but his focus was not 
changed. His focus, his mind was stayed on Jesus. And so, beloved, his imprisonment from his perception was a part of the unfolding, manifold wisdom of God. Well, we got to understand today that God was using the Apostle Paul as an instrument to, mm -hmm. to bring light to, to that which was once in darkness. Yep. God was using the Apostle Paul to reveal that which was once concealed. Yep. Beloved, God was using the Apostle Paul and his sufferings as the instrument by which Jews and Gentiles would become one body in Christ who is our head. Amen. This is what we call the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel of grace is looking at how God saved us. Mm -hmm. Yes, each and every one of us here today who has been saved has a testimony to tell on how God has saved us. Amen. And so the mystery of our great salvation is that God in Christ mm -hmm. has unified us all together, whether we are Jew or Gentile, into the family of God. Mm -hmm. And it's such an amazing and glorious work of God that as we learned the last time that I was up before you, that the angels are stooping down, if you will, in order to gaze upon the church. Yes, the angels are stooping down and looking at the church, looking at us in amazement to see the work that God is doing in and through the church. Hence, I always tell people that angels don't know what it's like to yes. sing Amazing Grace. Yes. Angels don't understand what salvation is by grace. Yes. The angels, beloved, don't understand or have a comprehension of what it looks like to be delivered and saved from sin. For Make Jesus didn't die for angels. <laughs> reason why when one of your loved ones die and they die in Christ, they don't become an angel. <laughs> yes, because they are the redeemed of the Lord. They understand what it was and what it took to redeem them from their sins. We go into the presence of the Lord. Yeah, make it clear. So Paul perceived his suffering. He had this outlook, this, this vision of his suffering as a means by which his life would be used to the glory of God. And so, how do you perceive your suffering? How do you look at your present suffering? I mean, the meaning that we assign to our suffering plays a major role in whether or not we're going to move forward in our suffering or we're going to remain paralyzed in our suffering. Well, because the truth of the matter is, in life we are going to encounter many things that make us feel uncertain. Yes, sir. But this one thing we can be sure of as long as we live regarding our suffering, Jesus is going to be with us. Yes, if we suffer, we need to know today that Christ is with us. Is he not Emmanuel? Mm -hmm. God with us. See, because the truth of the matter is as well is nobody is going to get out of this life unscathed. Amen. Amen. <laughs> nobody is going to get out of this life without going through a season of suffering. Amen. And so how we respond to the reality that we must all pass through the valley of suffering determines how we perceive the ultimate purpose 
of our suffering. Beloved, we must perceive our suffering as a means by which God gets the glory out of our lives. Don't you know God wants to get the glory out of your life? He didn't just save you so you can pat yourself on the back and congratulate yourself for being a Christian. God wants to get the glory out of your life. Our momentary light affliction is achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond anything that we can imagine or compare with in this world. For we don't look to the things that are seen. Mm -hmm. oh, we, we look at the things that are unseen because the things that are seen, they fade away. Man. But the things that are not seen, those things are eternal. And so, beloved, we must understand that our suffering is never for nothing. Mm. <laughs> you may be sitting here today and you may be asking yourself, well, why am I going through this? <laughs> Whatever this is, and we need to understand that whatever this is, it's never for nothing. Mm. What you are going through is not just so you can go through it. What you are going through is in order for God to manifest his glory in your life. So, beloved, can I encourage you today not to waste your suffering? Mm. Don't waste your suffering by just simply saying, oh, woe is me. <laughs> now continue to let God use you in your suffering because you never know who's paying attention to you while you suffer. You never know how God is using your bed of affliction to draw someone closer to him. So be encouraged today to look upon your suffering with new eyes. Yes, be encouraged today to look upon your suffering with the lenses of Scripture. Oh yes, our present sufferings are difficult. Oh yes, our present sufferings are painful. Yes, at times our suffering may be cross-shaped. Mm -hmm. But understand, God knows the plans yes. that he has for you. God has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. God has plans to give us a hope and a future. So, beloved, when we come to this one verse here that is before us, Paul does not see himself or view himself as a prisoner of Caesar. He does not view himself even as a prisoner of those who brought the false charges against him. In Paul's perception of his imprisonment, he views himself as a prisoner of Christ. Can I tell you today, not to view yourself as a prisoner of what it is that you're going through. Oh yeah, I wish I had a witness. Don't view yourself as a prisoner to your circumstances. Don't let your circumstances form your identity of who you are in Christ because Paul didn't allow his circumstances to form his identity. His identity wasn't in his circumstances. His identity was in Christ. So when you even look at Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1, you'll see that Paul says that he was a prisoner of Christ. Mm -hmm. He didn't say he was a prisoner of the Gentiles. He said he was a prisoner of Christ. And when we come to verse 13, the text that we read to take under consideration today he is concluding this particular section of Ephesians just as he began it. In verse 1, he said he was a prisoner of Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Here in verse 13, Paul says 
Don't lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf. But, beloved, what I want us to get in verse 13 is I want us to pay close attention to the word therefore. The word therefore in verse 13 is a pointer. And it's pointing to everything the Apostle Paul has said in verses 2 through 12 in this particular section. And as we have worked our way through this particular section, verses 2 through 12, we found that Paul had the right perspective. He did not allow his predicament to change his perspective. Y'all remember that, don't you? And I want to encourage you again, just by way of reminder, not to allow your predicament in life to change your perspective about the God that you serve. Amen. Come on. But, but also, Paul had this mentality that uh, his life was a, a privilege. The ministry that he had was a privilege. It was a privilege for the Apostle Paul to be able to share the mystery of the gospel of grace. Mm -hmm. Because after all, it was God who planned the mystery of the gospel of grace. But then we learn that uh, the power of the mystery of the gospel of grace is not necessarily in us. Amen. Yes, we don't go through what it is that we go through in order to show people how strong we are. Amen. Yeah, some people go through something and they want to show people just how strong. Yeah, I can get through it. I can get through it. No. The Christian life is not about showing folk how strong we are in ourselves. It's about showing folk or demonstrating how God's power is made perfect in our weaknesses. And so we were reminded that the mystery of the gospel of grace must be preached. And not only this, but it was brought to the forefront of our minds that the purpose of the mystery of the gospel of grace is that both Jews and Gentiles would become joint heirs, joint members of the family of God. And so God opened up our eyes to see that one of the many benefits that we have as beneficiaries of the mystery of the gospel of grace is permanent access to God. Listen. As a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you got access. Access has been granted to us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to approach him or approach the throne of grace to receive the mercy and the grace that we need in our time of need. You don't have to go through an intermediary. Amen. Listen, you don't have to go through me or anybody else. You can go directly to God for yourself. Amen. And so today, beloved, we observe this, this dimension of being under pressure in regards to the mystery of the gospel of grace. But, but not just the pressure, but the principle or the basic truths that we need to learn as a result of being under pressure. Because for Paul, beloved, if you look again real closely at verse 13, he, he, he asks these saints not to lose heart at his tribulations. And tribulations speak to being under pressure. Mm -hmm. Tribulation speaks to being hemmed into a narrow place. And you get hemmed in so tight by the pressure, you feel like the walls are closing in on you. And you they begin to close in as you feel that they are to the point that you don't feel like you have a way of escape. This pressure Paul was experiencing was literal. You know what it's like to sit in prison? Not knowing the outcome of your life? This was literal for him. This was not something figurative or imaginary that he was making up in his mind. This was something that he was experiencing that was real. His pressure was real. 
And I suspect today, beloved, that your pressure, your pressure, what you are under is real. And have you ever been in one of those conversations before with somebody, and, and no matter how much you try to explain to them what you are going through, they just can't seem to understand the amount of pressure Amen. that you are facing. Yeah. And so the pressure that Paul was experiencing was as a result of him being an ambassador for Christ. And, and a lot of times the pressure that we experience can be mental. It can be physical, but understand that, that, that no matter how heavy the pressure is that we are experiencing, we need to always remember that we're never crushed. Yeah. Our circumstances may look like there is no way out, but we need to always remember God is faithful. Yes, yes. And God's faithfulness yes. ought not to be called into question just because we are under pressure. Good word, God. Beloved, when we are under pressure, all that means is we are in God's waiting room. Amen. And even in God's waiting room, we need to remember that God is faithful. Amen. Amen. God is faithful. He was faithful in your past. He's yes, faithful amen. in our present. He'll be faithful in our future. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you are under pressure, well, it is good to remember that it's because of the Lord's mercies mm -hmm. that we are not consumed. His compassions fail not. As a matter of fact, they are new every morning. And because his mercy is new every morning, we can boldly declare, even in the middle of our circumstances, even in the middle of our hell breaking loose in your life, that great is his faithfulness. And since we know our God is faithful, we understand that he knows exactly how much we can handle. Oh, yes, he does. He, he knows how much yeah. we can handle and he knows how to provide in such a way that we can stand up under it. Yeah. It's not that God is going to bring you out of it. Right. Hey, Paul didn't get out of prison. Yeah. <laughs> we can't miss that. Paul didn't get out of prison. I'm going to repeat that again. Paul didn't get out of prison. But he was given grace and strength to stand up under it. You may not get healed. You may not get delivered from that particular circumstance, but God will give you strength. Oh, yes, he will heal. God will give you strength where you can handle it. He'll give you strength to stand. In other words, uh, you may get squeezed in life to the point that where you feel like you can't get squeezed no more, but that don't mean you squash. Amen, tell it. Oh no, because tell God it. is going to give you strength yeah. to stand. You may get knocked down yeah. in life, mm -hmm. but just because you get knocked down does not mean that you're not out. Yeah. Are y'all tracking with me this morning? Yes. As Paul tells these saints not to lose heart. <laughs> Don't lose heart at uh, my tribulations. <laughs> Don't give up on God because you see me going through a bout of suffering. Mm -hmm. And this is the principle of the pressure that we're under. And the principle is, is we all are tempted Every single one of us from the pulpit to the door. We are tempted to lose heart. Man. To become discouraged. When our lives are under pressure. It's very easy. It for a saint of God. A child of God. To lose on, heart. Mm. When our lives are under pressure. Yes, Don't you know Jesus said man ought to always pray yes, and not faint. Yes, Translation is man ought to always pray 
and not lose heart, mm -hmm. not give up, not throw in the towel yeah. because our lives are under pressure. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, when our lives are under pressure, instead of giving up, instead of throwing in the towel and yeah. saying, I call it, saying, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Pray. Amen. I know it sounds simplistic. <laughs> But that's what our Lord says. Pray. Because that's where your resource comes from. Mm -hmm. That's where your strength comes from. Jesus. So let me ask you. Are you among those who yield to the onslaught of discouragement? Because here's symptomatic that you, you're yielding to the onslaught of, of discouragement because of the pressure in your life. The, 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 the symptom is this. That you check out on church. Mm. Yeah, come on now. Mm. Yeah, you check out on church. You ever met folk like that before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They start going through a difficult season in their life, and the first thing they stop doing is attending church. Mm -hmm. They go AWOL from church because of the pressures that life is pushing up on them. Mm -hmm. you know, and so they feel the best thing for them to do is just stay at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stay away from church. But what we need to know today is when life begins to put pressure on you, well, that's when you need to be up in the church. Amen. You need to be amongst the saints of God. When life begins to squeeze you in, because that's where we draw support from one another. Amen. We get strength from one another. Yeah, you never know what somebody is going through when they walk up in this place on Sunday morning. Hence, yeah. be careful. Yeah. We got to be careful with our words. Yeah. Because our words can either encourage or discourage. Yeah. yeah, beloved, we need to know today the church is essential. The church is not only essential for us personally, the church is central to the overall plan of God. Amen. Yes. Amen. The church is central to the overall plan of God. And you may be asking, well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's central to the overall plan of God for him to manifest his glory in the earth. Because when folks see the church being the church, when folks see the church in all of its multicolored existence and expressions, it reflects the glory of God. So the drama of redemption is put on display through the church to the praise of God's glory. And actually, when we look at verse 13 very closely, Paul, if you look at it closely, he's saying by way of implication that his tribulations were really not about him. Mm. Do you see that right there? Yeah, yeah. It, it was not about him, but it was for them. I mean, he, he actually says it specifically. He says it was for their glory. Did you catch that? I mean, I spent about three hours looking at that right there for their glory. He says, I'm suffering. I'm in prison. I went through all kinds of trouble in my life. And he says, it's for your glory. I'm, I'm suffering on behalf of you Gentiles so that you will be the church that God has saved you to be. Come on. So that you would display the manifold wisdom of God in the world to his glory. Yes. See, the church is the glory of God. Amen. If God, beloved, Amen. is to be glorified in the world, it's going to come through the church. Amen. It's going to come through the church with warts and wrinkles, suffering and tribulation outside of creation. Hmm. 
The only glory that people are going to see that reflects the beauty and the grace and the mercy and the love of God mm. is in the church. Amen. Amen. God's people are reflectors, if you will, of the glory of God. We exist as the church to make the gospel visible. Mm. As we carry out the Missio Day. The mission of God. Folk are seeing the church and they're like, give glory to God. Yes, yes. They see our good works and they give glory to God. And we understand that even in our suffering, our suffering is for the glory of God. And not only the glory of God as a church collectively, but the glory of one another as the church individually. Because we do know the church is not just brick and mortar, right? Everybody who is saved makes up the church. And so our suffering is not about us. It never has been about us. Our diseases are not about us. Cancer is not about us. COVID-19 is not about us. Pneumonia is not about us. Diabetes and high blood pressure is not about us. Dementia is not about us. Any other disease or pressure that you may find yourself oh, yeah. in, it's not about us. Yeah. It's about manifesting God's glory mm -hmm. through our lives individually and through the church collectively so that people may see the glory of God and by seeing the glory of God reflected through our lives, they praise his holy name. Yes. Yes. So beloved, we can't lose heart. That's right. We cannot lose heart. We can't give in under the pressure. We can't allow ourselves to get so discouraged that we forget who we are in Christ. Yes. Mm. We've got to be steadfast, immovable, yes. always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain. Mm. I understand that labor is not just church work. Come on. Or even the work of the church is not just the confined within the walls of this building that we worship in. Right. That labor is at home mm -hmm. with our kids, with our parents, with our grandkids. Mm -hmm. That labor is at work because we are manifesting the glory of God mm -hmm. to those we encounter mm -hmm. each and every day of our lives. So we must be steadfast. Word. We can't give up. For beloved, we shall reap a harvest of blessings if we faint not. So can I encourage you again not to give up? Because we are the church. You're the church. Can I encourage you not to give in? Because you know exactly everybody in here who has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. You know who your hope is in? Our hope is in our bridegroom. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our bridegroom, our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Yeah. Not only did he die for us, but uh, he rose from the grave and he's coming back for us. So until he returns... There is a present glory. And there is a future glory mm -hmm. that 
that we will experience when we are in his presence. But in the present, we need to know today that God is weaving every suffering, every difficult circumstance, every temptation, every trial, every sin that we face in life together for his for our good and for his glory. God in his deep wisdom mm -hmm. and his deep knowledge has woven all the various difficulties that we face in our lives as a display of his glory. My God. Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 18. He said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing mm -hmm. to the glory that shall be revealed. And when Paul said this, he, he said, I consider, which means he, he put what he was going through on the scale in comparison, to yeah. with, in comparison with the glory yeah. that he was experiencing in that, oh, in, in comparison to the suffering, he, he, was, he was putting what he went through on the scale in comparison to the glory that shall be revealed to him. And when he put it on the scale, there was no comparison to the glory that would be revealed in him and us. Beloved, we need to understand that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can be compared to the glory to be revealed in us. Hence we know that there is a future glory. For the Bible says no eye has seen. No ear has heard. Neither has it entered into the hearts of man what God has prepared for those who love him. And if you love him, you need to know today that what was sown in dishonor will one day be raised in glory. What was sown in weakness is one day going to be raised in power because as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are moving from glory to glory. And we need to understand our lives are to be lived with the chief aim that we glorify God and enjoy Him forever regardless of what it is that we are going through in our lives for all of the glory belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't say some of the glory. I said all of the glory. Well, we've been saved for his glory. We've been redeemed for his glory. And God uses everything for his glory. Hence, God is to be praised for his glory. Yes, God deserves our worship. God deserves our praise. Adoration and glory belong to his name, for the Lord is great. And he's greatly to be praised. Praise. Because God's glory is in a class all by itself. Praise. Because God's glory is a reflection of everything he is. So let everything, as the psalmist says, praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So in light of our future glory, the appropriate thing for us to do is not to come into the worship with bow down heads. Well, but instead of having bowed down heads, we ought to, in the words of the psalmist, lift up our heads, O oh, ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, because the King of glory wants to come in. You may ask, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, he is. King of glory. From him and through him and to him are all things. 
hands. And to him belongs the glory forever. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. And may heaven smile upon you. Perhaps there may be somebody here today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The Bible simply says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so, if you want to know more about what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can just simply come and see me after service and I will try to do the best that I can to explain what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ.